Hi, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. I'm Liv, your host, here with a bonus episode where I answer your questions. You can also find more questions and answers on my Instagram story highlights. You all have so many, I couldn't possibly answer them all here. It's all very surreal. So I've included in this episode the questions that came from outside of my Insta story and those I feel are broad enough to warrant lots of people getting an answer. This episode is a bonus. You're not going to miss out on anything to do with the myths or the stories if you don't listen to it. It's just for if you're interested. So thank you for being interested. Here we go. First question, when and how did you first start your podcast? Any advice? This is as good a place to start as any, which is why I picked it as the first one. Let's talk about, oh, not the name of this podcast. Let's talk about the history of this podcast. I almost just sung it again. So a few years back, I moved from Toronto to Vancouver. I love Toronto so damn much, but I seriously can't handle Canadian winters, nor can I really handle hot and humid summers. I grew up on the West Coast, where we don't get either of those things and somehow are still Canada, and my body has never adapted. Somehow. Even though I lived in Montreal and Toronto for eight years. Whatever, body. Cold is not for me. So I moved to Vancouver, and I had a job I hated, and I knew a grand total of like two people who lived there, and I never saw them. I was bored and lonely and seriously needed a hobby. I was listening to podcasts nonstop because it really makes you feel like you have friends around, like you're part of something. It helped me more than anything else. I have the best friend group in Toronto, but honestly, Vancouver was a huge bummer. So one day, after listening to I don't even know how many hours of podcasts because I really did it nonstop, I just thought, hey, I really fucking love Greek mythology and I really like telling stories in my own crazy person voice. So why don't I just Google how easy it is to start a podcast and kind of go from there? The ladies of My Favorite Murder, which is my favorite podcast, talk about just kind of doing it one day. So how hard could it be? I googled the shit out of it and got a random microphone and started writing. Everything I know about starting the podcast and recording and editing and everything, literally everything, I learned through Google. I still don't know a lot. I still think my editing skills are atrocious. But hey, it's working for me. We're a year and a half in now, so it seems to be going pretty okay. My advice is this. If you want to do it and you think you have something to say that people will want to hear or that you just want to get out there... Do some Googling and make it happen. I really had no idea what the fuck I was doing, but Google kind of has all the answers. Next question. Would you name your child, if you plan on having one, with a Greek god or goddess name? Okay, so zero interest in having kids. At 30, I'm pretty much determined. I absolutely never want that because, well, honestly, they all make me uncomfortable and the whole process seems pretty disgusting. But if I did, yes, I would name them that. Which name? I don't know. I'd probably go with something subtle. Something that wouldn't seem too insane, especially because I'm not Greek. But something, that's for sure. Next question. How did you get into myths and at what age? If I remember right, I was probably in grade 6 or 7, so 11 or 12. And we had to pick a myth to write about. I picked Cupid and Psyche, and it was all over from there. I actually started out deeply obsessed with Egyptian myths, I would say more so than Greek, and I do still love those, but Greek calls to me in a way nothing else does. I know I talk about how crazy they all are, but honestly I feel this insane connection to the stories and the characters, and I just can't even properly describe how I feel about them, their myths and the history, just that time period broadly. I'm obsessed. Obviously. Next question. If you could do the podcast as a day job that pays the bills, would you? so fucking lutely I would. Would I ever. Honestly, though, I really do like my job now, but long term, it's definitely the dream to be able to do this full time. I'm constantly wishing I could do more in-depth stories for you guys or just make them more often, but just keeping the basic ones going takes most, if not all, of my spare time. I'm also a person that needs to veg out if they're going to stay sane, so that's a big part of it. So having this as my whole job would be amazing and definitely result in a better podcast. So who knows? goals. Next, favorite historical figure. Fun question. It's so hard to say. I think Homer is fascinating simply because we know so little about him. Like, was he real? Did he really come up with the Iliad and the Odyssey? Or did he hear them from someone and just pass it on? I would just so love to know more about the history of these stories. Like, just some proof of things would be cool. 
But also Herodotus is fascinating because he set out to basically be the first legit historian. Like in a world where history wasn't studied the way it is now, how do you come up with that as a goal? Just fascination with the world around you, I guess? Anyway, he's super interesting. And Sappho, though I don't know enough about her, but one day I do want to do an episode on her, so I will by then. Completely separately from ancient Greece, I absolutely love Jane Austen. If you haven't read Pride and Prejudice, do, because it's great, but also such a wonderful commentary on being a woman back then and the general idea of marriage, which was totally fucked, but it's just told in the most wonderful story. Now, this next one is a collection of questions that I quite enjoyed reading, and I will answer them individually. One, what is your cat's name? The question here is also questioning the number of cats, so let me answer and explain. So, I personally have one cat, his name is Lupin, from Harry Potter, because I got him 12 years ago, which somehow also happens to be how long ago Deathly Hallows came out. He got his name because Lupin perished and was my favorite character. However, I do call him Squishy more often than I call him Lupin, but he's a cat, so he doesn't give a fuck. If you follow my personal account on Instagram, he's the black and white tuxedo cat. He's very distinguished. There is, however, another cat with which I share a home. See, I live with my younger sister. I mean, she's 29, so she's not young, but she's younger than me. In any event, she has a cat. If you follow me on Instagram, you will see him often featured with dry captions about how beautiful he is and yet so mean. He's half Maine Coon and they are supposed to be nice and he is only nice if you're outside and not bothering him. Anyway, his name is Gus. He's very fluffy and I like to force pets on him while staying agile to prevent major injury by his enormous claws and teeth. Question two, how many tattoos do you have and what are they? Oh man, okay, not going to go into all of them except to say that I have 13. While none of them are directly related to Greek mythology, I do have an enormous olive branch along my back and my side, so that's cool. I really like olives, just generally, to eat, to look at, to use as oil, to use as wood, Much like the Greeks. What a coincidence. I also have a watercolor scene on my arm that you can probably see usually in pictures. That's a painting my dad did. He's a local watercolor artist here. But it's of a beach in Tofino, which has some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. It's on my island. Again, Google it. It's pretty. Also, it's got the best surfing in Canada, but also I think some of the best in North America, maybe? It's just cold, because, you know, Northern Pacific. Anyway, there are another 11, but those can be left to the imagination. I'm planning a mythological tattoo, though. Just need to actually get a consultation and find money. Question three, what made you decide to do the podcast? Well, for that answer, I'll refer to the first answer I gave in this episode. Easy peasy. Question four, do you have any siblings? Hey, would you look at that? I just answered that in the question about my cat. Anyway, yes, I have one sister. Her name is Jessica. Question five, are all your friends super awesome ultra mythology nerds too? Oh man, no but they do tolerate me. So much so that my wonderful friend Sarah in Toronto is very frequently calling me famous and sending me books. This is not true, but it's nice to hear. Thank you, Sarah. Question six. Do you know you're funny as hell? No. I'm still not quite sure that's true, but oh man, do I love that you all think so. It's truly the highlight of my life that people laugh at this podcast. Before this outlet, I was just that person who laughed at their own shit. I mean, I still am, but now other people are laughing too. So thank you for the person who sent all those questions in. It was great. Now here's one I've gotten a few times in a few different forms. How long does it take you to research, record, and upload a full-length episode and mini-myth? Whew, that really depends on the episode. The Odyssey has been pretty nice because I'm only reading the one source, the Odyssey, so it's a bit easier. I'm reading and writing a general script at the same time. But when it's a tougher story or like a character where I have to put together a bunch of stories from a bunch of sources, it can take forever. I mean, I think the Odyssey ones probably take six hours to write and like a more hardcore one would take like eight to ten, if not more, to write a full length episode. Probably half that for a mini myth. For context, I write a script for each episode because I'm really not good at on the fly. And a full length episode is anywhere between 4,000 and 5,000 plus words, whereas a mini myth can be between 1,500 and 3,000 words. So, you know, they're pretty long. Recording takes like half an hour to an hour, depending on the length, and editing is usually about double the length of the episode. Uploading is easy peasy, thankfully. This is a very specific question that came in from Helen, so I'm just going to paraphrase. Would you recommend anywhere on Crete other than Knossos to visit? Hopefully this applies to more of you, but 
Knossos is obviously the big one on Crete. There are lots of other smaller Bronze Age sites that are absolutely worth seeing. I would say looking for any other archaeological sites that you might be able to visit is totally worth your time. That is, if you want to look at really, really old archaeological sites, that's most of Crete. I'm not talking Acropolis level either. More like you can see the outlines of rooms and basically and the basics of what might have been in them, but there's not a lot left standing. But that's because it's so much older than most of the ruins we know in Greece, like thousands of years older. So I don't know of any offhand other than Knossos. I did a course in Bronze Age archaeology about a hundred years ago, which is what I know of in Crete. There may also be later sites you can visit that are more intact and tourist friendly. I'd suggest a cursory Google. I've been only to Hanya, and the only reason I was able to see Crete at all is when I graduated at university, my mom took me on a Mediterranean cruise, which was super cool. So it was a really brief visit to Hanya, but totally incredible. It's lovely, it has a small Bronze Age site to view, but it's also a port town, so it's got stunning views, and I had my favorite ever meal there. A stretch of the word meal, perhaps. It was just a plate of tzatziki and bread, a plate of feta, and a plate of olives, accompanied by wine. Jesus, it was seriously the best thing I've ever eaten. I talk about it way too often because it was not really a meal. Anyway, fucking olives, you guys. So Crete in general is just a wonderful island to visit. So have so much fun and know that I'm so jealous you'll be seeing Knossos. What I would not give to see the dolphin mosaics, which I don't know where they are now, but they were once in the palace of Knossos and they are unfucking real Next question. Do you know of any other good stories of women in Greek mythology who successfully pulled off clever tricks like Penelope pretending to weave a burial shroud for Odysseus to ward off suitors? Anyone else like Penelope? So my first thought is the Lysistrata, which is not a myth per se, but an ancient Greek play. It's a pretty clever trick pulled by a number of women. I've recently read that that story was interpreted as misogynistic, as in lessening the importance of women because of how they went about stopping this war, but honestly, I'd rather take it as empowering because I think it's awesome and hilarious. What a way to get a man's attention when you don't have the same explicit political power as they do. Anyway, that's my first thought, and offhand, I can't think of any other tricky women, but I will be on the lookout for more because I'm sure the wonderful Penelope can't be the only example. This email came in late, but I hadn't actually finished writing the episode, so good timing. There's a few questions here. So, one, how did the ancient Greeks explain how centaurs reproduced? So, man, I wish I knew the answer to this. I would say they probably just didn't explain it. There weren't a lot of centaurs. There was Chiron, but as I told you guys, he was different from the pack of centaurs otherwise described. And yeah, there was the pack of them, but I think probably they just considered them to be like the one group of male centaurs. I can't remember hearing of a female, so they were more like one-offs. This question notes not having heard of any woman human, like raising centaur babies. From what I know, that's right. There are no, say, instances of women having sex with horses and having random centaurs. They're not like the minotaur in that way. Not that there was more than one minotaur, but you know what I mean. Anyway, the logistics would be interesting. But sadly, I don't have examples of centaur babies. And I will paraphrase this other question because it's one I got from a few of you during the Instagram portion of the Q&A. Go back to the beginning. What did I major in in university and what was my plan for it? And what do I do now for a career aside from the podcast? So this is going to be a little long-winded, but from what I've gathered from your questions on Instagram and via email, it might be helpful to any of you graduating high school or just generally figuring out what the fuck you want to do. So... I graduated high school in, God, 2006. At the time, I thought I didn't want to go to university. I thought I had no need for it and no interest and basically planned to just figure my shit out as I went. I worked a lot of retail jobs and then I got a job at a web design company where I did reception and administrated a couple of their websites. Fun fact, they're impossible to find now, but I once lent my voice to a couple of characters in an education cartoon series about math, like in space. I've searched, but sadly... I don't think they're still online. When I worked there, I started writing a book. As I just mentioned, I've been into Greek mythology for a while, and I don't remember how I found the idea for this book, but basically I started writing a novel, just for fun, and it featured characters from mythology. I ended up really loving the process, and I finished the book, and then I was looking at getting it published. At the same time, I was laid off from my job, and I needed to figure out my life again. So I'm looking at getting it published, and I don't have a job, and I realize, damn, that actual publishing process seems pretty exciting and up my alley. So then that was my plan. I decided to go back to school to get into book publishing. 
At the time, I applied for a major in English Lit for that reason, and with a minor in Classics because I just love that shit. But by the time I was in my first semester, I realized that every elective I was going to take was going to be more Classics, so I just switched to a double major. So basically, I'm sorry to say that for so many of you asking what I had planned to do with my Classics degree when I took it, I didn't plan anything. (laughs) I never intended to use it at all. I just loved it and wanted to learn more. When I graduated, I then did some grad school for publishing again. I got a paid internship with Kobo, the ebook company. Fuck unpaid internships, ban them forever. And I eventually got a job in contracts, uh, in the contracts department of Random House, which then became Penguin Random House. It was awesome. It's where I met all my favorite friends and where I met some pretty incredible authors. I have an epic signed book collection, guys. But eventually, I needed to move back west, and publishing isn't really a thing out here, and honestly, it also pays absolute shit, even when you've been there for years. Sorry. So I left it. And that's where we link up to my first answer at the top of this episode. I moved to Vancouver, I got a job I hated, and ended up starting the podcast. Eventually, I quit that job, thank God, and I moved back to Victoria, which is where I grew up and where I am now. I went back into retail. I like dealing with customers and, well, now I'm the boss. So honestly, I manage a clothing store here. It's pretty basic. It's cool. I get free clothes. But yeah, I mean, that's, it's anticlimactic because all to say I'm not doing anything with either of those majors except the podcast. I'm not doing something I would explicitly call a career, but honestly, it's perfect for me right now. The job is good. It doesn't stress me out. And I get to go home and continue to build the podcast. Because as I mentioned earlier, I would love for this to be a full-time job. Until then, I have a fairly easy job that gets me free clothes and allows me to be the boss of a group of lovely young people who are wonderful but make me feel very old sometimes. None of them watch the OC, you guys. They don't even know what it was. Ugh. Well, guys, it's all I have time for, and I hope it was even remotely coherent. It turns out it's weird doing it by yourself, but there you go. This podcast is just by myself. I answered a bunch of fun, quick questions on my Instagram story, like I mentioned at the top. So head over to Instagram and search Myths Baby. Find me, follow me, check out the highlights on there for the answers to all the other questions. Also, I'm announcing the promised Instagram contest. Make sure you're following me on Instagram and be on the lookout for a post. I will be posting about the contest. You will need to like that post and comment with your favorite god and why. I will pick my favorite and they will win a Myths Baby tote bag. Either it'll be my podcast logo or the new Goddesses of the Judgment of Paris, your pick. So stay tuned. That's coming in the next few days. Thank you all for listening. I hope you found these questions and answers entertaining and or illuminating or whatever you wanted it to be. You're all the best. I am Liv and I love this shit.